Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Meese. Wind power. Advocates say it promises plentiful, clean energy, while detractors label it costly and unnecessary. The state of Rhode Island sided with supporters, offering bipartisan support for two wind farms off the coast and giving deep water wind a lucrative deal to build them. Are the projects on track? How much will they cost? And could they become another Rhode Island boondock? This week on Executive Suite, we'll get answers from Deepwater Wind Chief Administrative Officer Jeffrey Grabowski. Welcome to the first episode of Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. You know, there's no bigger challenge facing Rhode Island than figuring out how to grow the economy, create jobs, and get the state back on its feet. And here on Executive Suite, we're going to talk to business leaders about their successes and their challenges. We want to have open, honest conversations about what's working and what needs to change. So let's get things started with our first guest, Jeffrey Grabowski. He's Chief Administrative Officer of Deepwater Wind. Jeff, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Ted. Glad to have you on the very first episode here. It's a, it's a big honor. It's an realize. honor being on the top rated <laughs> business program in Rhode Island. It is. It it's is. I think this will be the, the most watched episode of this program I'm ever. I'm sure it will. <laughs> so let's start with the basics here on uh, Deepwater sure. Wind. The company was picked back in 08. There was a bidding process. People are just going to want to know, what are you building and when are turbines going to start spinning? So uh, g give us the basics on the first of the two projects. Sure. So the short answer is we're building offshore wind farms. And we expect that the first turbines will be spinning in 2014, just about a year and a half from now. Uh, we are building our first project off of Block Island. Mm -hmm. So that's a project most people have heard about. That's a smaller project, a demonstration scale. So it's about three miles southeast of Block Island. So if you're standing on the, at the southeast light at Block Island, and you're looking to the southeast, you'll, you'll see that wind farm in a few years. So my producer, Nick, called up the map for us you sent along. Right. So what, uh, walk us through, what are we looking at so here? So you're, uh, you're looking at a map of Block Island, and to the southeast in yellow, you'll see f uh, five dots. Uh, those are the five turbines, and each one of those turbines will be six megawatts. And so in total, that's 30 megawatts. That's roughly the amount that, uh, of power you need to, gen to power about 17,000 homes. So these are pretty big turbines. They will, in fact, be among the biggest wind turbines anywhere in the world at 6 megawatts. There are a bunch of these turbines in Europe right now, offshore and onshore. Um, the 6 megawatt turbine is a really exciting thing because it really is the next stage of developing wind farms globally. And these are coming from Siemens, the big uh, German This is Siemens. The, Siemens is one of the largest global uh, industrial companies. They are the best manufacturer wind turbines globally. And this Siemens turbine that we're, we're going to install off Block Island is about 600 feet tall. And the, the, the uh, rotor diameter from one tip to the other tip of those blades is about 550 feet wide. Wow. So they are very big pieces of industrial equipment. It's a real power plant. Uh, but the great thing is, it's clean, it's renewable. So uh, this is going to connect to Block Island and it's going to feed back into, we saw the two lines there, the yellow yep. line was taking you from the turbines back to Block Island Power Company, right? And then That's a right. red line going back to the mainland. What, where, right. where was the power going to go? What's yeah, gonna so uh, you know, uh, many Rhode Islanders may not realize that Block Island is not electrically connected to the rest of the state right now. So the island is, is powered right now by several diesel generators that are on the island and diesel fuel comes across on ferries to power that island. And Block Island is such a beautiful place. Unfortunately, it has some of the dirtiest power generators in all of uh, New England. And so expensive power, too. Very right? expensive, up to 60 cents a mega, uh, kilowatt hour during the summer. So our plan is we're going to connect the wind farm first to the island. Which is the yellow line there. That's right. That's the yellow line. So we will connect into the distribution system that exists on Block Island. And then the red line is the transmission system that we are also going to build, which connects the wind farm and the island to the, to the mainland. And where is it connecting up top there? Uh, we, our proposed landfall is in Narragansett. In Gar Narragansett, okay. So we need to take that wind power and interconnect with National Grid's existing system. And then it'll feed into the broader power supply it'll in New It'll feed into the whole New England power market, okay. correct. Um, now, what has to happen for you to get there? With, we're still sticking with the Block Island project here. I mean, right now we're talking it's the uh, middle of 2012. You're right. talking about spinning by the end of 2014. Right. Uh, what, what happens in between? How do you get there? So we've hit a couple big milestones to date, and, and the biggest are 
uh, we have an agreement with National Grid to buy our power. That's, mm -hmm. that's a big uh, milestone. The second big milestone is that Siemens has agreed to sell us these brand new turbines that they are gonna, going to be uh, marketing across the globe. It was a big coup for us to have this partnership with Siemens, one of the largest industrial companies wouldn't in the world. Wouldn't they sell them to anybody? No, you know, they, they wouldn't because this is a brand new turbine. Uh, it'll be this deployment here in Block Island will probably be this, only the second deployment anywhere in the world. And this will be the first offshore turbine in the U.S. So it's a high profile project even for a company like Siemens. So that's what, those are pretty big steps uh, to date. In 2012, we'll be finishing the permitting process for the project. So our own Coastal Resources Management Council here in Rhode Island will be reviewing the project along with a number of federal agencies that have to review our project plans, how we're going to build the project. We expect that we'll get through those approvals um, in 2012 and early 13. That allows us to build uh, at the end of 2013. Will there be public hearings? How does that process work? Yeah, I think we'll have pretty extensive public hearings. Okay. Um, we will have uh, public people hearings. people want to give you an earful, uh, some of them. Some people do want to give us an earful, but, um, but I think a whole lot more people are excited to see this go forward. So we'll be having public hearings on Block Island in Narragansett, probably in Providence as well, uh, so that people can hear about the project and give the federal and state agencies their input. Now, construction, let's say you get the approvals yeah. you need. Uh, we're talking now into 2013, 2014 That's for right. construction. Correct. Uh, where do they get built? How many people get hired? What's sort of the industrial process to get those yeah, out there? Th this is an enormous industrial project. So um, although we call it a demonstration scale project, all in costs the transmission line and the wind farm is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $300 million. So the turbines will come from Europe. Much of the foundation, which is the metal structure that connects the turbine to the seafloor, will be fabricated at Quonset Point in North Kingston. Mm -hmm. So we'll be hiring uh, several hundred people to weld lots and lots of steel. Uh, there's about a thousand tons of steel that goes into the foundation that connects that turbine to the ocean floor. Um, so the foundation goes in, the turbines come in from Europe with enormous vessels that pick that thousand tons of turbine mm -hmm. up into the air and put it uh, onto that foundation in the middle of the ocean. It's quite uh, an enormous undertaking uh, and there will be hundreds of people involved in that process. Now there is a second project. This is right. where people sometimes get confused and we're talking a number of years out there. Let's, uh, Nick, if we could call up the map uh, of sort of broader New England. And this is going to show you the, what are you calling it, the Deepwater Wind? Deepwater Wind Energy Center. What is this? This is our second project. Uh, and while Bro Block Island is uh, the demonstration scale project that we think we will build first, the second project is located further off in federal waters. It is a much larger wind farm. Uh, How many are we talking? 150 turbines versus the five that we're bu building at Block Island. So 150 turbines located about 18 miles to the uh, east of Block Island, 15 miles to the southwest in Martha's Vineyard. So that's really where it's located between the vineyard uh, and Block Island. That project we are designing to sell power into multiple states, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and even New York. Mm -hmm. Now, the, one more question on that, which is how far away is that project and how, how much, I mean, I think you've said that could, that's more than a billion dollars yeah, probably. That's, that that's a multi-billion dollar project because it, it includes not just 150 turbines, uh, but it also includes a transmission system that would link Long Island to southeastern New England. So there's a, quite a bit involved there. It's a multi-billion dollar project. It would require several big power buyers, utilities in New England and uh, Long Island to buy power from that project. And the first year of operation, if everything went according to plans, would be about 2017. 2017, so ways away on that Ways one. away. Construction would have to start probably around 14 and 15 to get to, to reach that 2017 date. All right, we have to take a break. When we come back, the challenges and the critics of offshore wind. Our guest this week, Deepwater Winds' Jeffrey Grabowski. Stay with us. You're watching Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is Jeff Grabowski, Chief Administrative Officer of Deepwater Wind. Jeff, let's turn to, to some of the concerns that are out there about any project at this point. We're still reeling from what just happened with 38 Studios. People don't need to be updated on that. Is this another one of those deals or taxpayers on the hook if, if uh, let's say, something falls apart or you, know, you can't build these turbines? How much has gone out the door already? How much is right. going to go out the door? Right. Well, th that's a pretty easy answer because we're building our project all with private money. So there's, there are no taxpayer dollars involved. We have invested 
probably of around $25 million to date on the Block Island project, which includes lots of engineering studies, designs, ocean surveys. We've been measuring the wind out on Block Island for a number of years. It's a very intensive, capital intensive process to build a wind farm. All of that money from our own private investors. So if for whatever reason I'm 100% wrong and the wind farm's never built, um, the only people who lose are our private investors, but that's not going to happen. We're going to be building uh, at the end of 2013, and we're pretty convinced Rhode Island will be the first place that we see an offshore wind farm in the U.S. And let's see, you think you'll be Cape Wind? I think we will. Yeah. You know, we have a pretty healthy rivalry. I think uh, <laughs> we very much support their project and want to see them get in the water as well. But uh, I think as neighboring companies and neighboring states, we have a pretty health healthy rivalry about who will be in the water first. You may, I want to stick with what you're saying there about investors. Uh, one lesson from 38 Studios a lot of people took away is the lack of private capital yeah. coming into that company made it unclear whether <coughs> you know, they should have been getting the support they got. Who, who, who are your backers? Where is the money coming from? You know, is it, is it, is yeah. it in China? Is it somewhere else? Where, where yeah. are your funders? No, our, our funders uh, are, are primarily a company called D.E. Shaw, which is a uh, technology company and investment company based in New York. They've invested in lots of energy companies, including renewable energy companies, uh, and another company called First Wind, uh, which is a Massachusetts-based onshore wind developer. And the difference between the businesses, um, uh, at least from, from one perspective here, is that when you, when you start to build a wind farm, at the beginning you have to know what it's going to cost you to build it. And our investors know what it's going to cost to build a wind farm. We've reserved all those dollars. We have the dollars to build this wind farm. So we're not looking to anyone else to, to uh, come up with additional dollars. We have what we need. We're going to build that Block Island wind farm. And there's no taxpayer so dollars So you know involved. how much you're going to need getting out. You're not going to come to the state in the middle of 2014 and say, we're so close, we Absolute, have half the blades, but give not. us a couple bucks and we'll absolutely get it. Absolutely not. Okay. You heard it here. All right. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to keep that tape. Um, you're, but, you know, people, I wrote a story recently about you guys for WPRI.com, and now uh, some of the pushback I got was, well, sure, they're not getting a, 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 a check from the General Assembly, but the project is happening because you got a 20-year power purchasing agreement, a contract right. with National Grid that'll pay deep water. I think it's almost $500 million above market rates over a 20-year period. Um, and you, you make no bones about that. That's why this is happening, right? Can you explain that? Yeah, well, w you know, we're a renewable energy company, and every renewable energy project in the U.S. Um, is able to be built because they sign a long-term contract with a utility company. Because unlike other types of resources, we ha all of our uh, capital comes up front. The wind is free. Once we put the steel in the ground, uh, we have very, very little operating costs in the long term. So we need a huge amount of money up front to build the project. Once the project is built, we can go forward and, and maintain it at a pretty low, low cost level, which means we need the security up front to know that if we build it, someone is going to buy that power over a 20-year period, which allows us to pay back those bank loans and, and private investors who gave you all the money up front. So every renewable energy project gets a long-term contract, and they largely happen because state governments have made policy decisions over the last decade, really, to promote renewable energy. So Rhode Island has a renewable energy standard, which requires a uh, national grid to get a percentage of its power from renewable energy sources. That's not unusual. Almost every Regardless of whether oh, it's from you, there's a separate right. policy, there's an overall policy in place. Absolutely. There's an overall policy that was adopted quite a number of years ago now, in the early 2000s, which requires utilities in many states on the Atlantic seaboard almost every state in the Northeast has this kind of requirement, to buy renewable energy. That's a policy decision that states have made, and they've made those decisions because they're looking long term. They know that long term we need to diversify our fuel sources. Uh, you know, natural gas looks pretty cheap today, but it was only a few years ago that natural gas was really, really expensive, and people were looking for alternatives to natural gas. Now we're seeing natural gas at its low point. Um, we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that natural gas is always going to be low. So we need a diverse set of fuel, fuels in New England. Offshore wind should be part of that mix. Let's talk about uh, what does it mean, the Block Island project, for the average Rhode Islander's electric bill? Yeah, I think, I think National Grid has estimated what the impact will be once uh, we're up and operational. And the impact will be about $1.35 a month on the average electricity bill. Now, that doesn't sound like much. We actually did a PRI poll, which okay. showed more than half of Rhode Islanders said they'd be willing to pay that to mm -hmm. get the project going. But some businesses, and this is a business show, have sure. expressed concern about bringing up around already does have high electricity costs, and adding this on top of that could raise their concerns. I mean, you must see these people. What do you say to them? What's your pitch to them? Well, our pitch to them is, is a, there are a few things to think about. Number one, 
we need to have a diverse uh, mix of fuel sources. And while you know, it sometimes is painful to make an investment up front in something that we think is going to pay off in the long term, it's something that as a, as a state, as a region, as a country, we need to do. We need to invest in fuel sources today, even those that are not the rock bottom cheapest sources of fuel, so that in the long term we have diversity and we're not dependent on one source like gas, which could spike up. And wind has the real benefit of having stable pricing. We can predict where that pricing is going to be 10, 20 years into the future. You can't say the same about, uh, about fossil fuels. So while we, would, we don't think that wind will ever be 80% of our, of our power generation in this region, we do think that it can be 10% of what we have, 15%. And at that level, it gives us a right mix between fossil fuels uh, that are market-based and long-term stable fuels like renewable energy. All right, we have to take another break. Coming up, is Rhode Island good or bad for business? We'll ask Jeff Grabowski, our guest, weighing in. Stay with us. You're watching Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Our guest this week, Jeff Grabowski, Chief Administrative Officer, Deepwater Wind. Uh, Jeff, I was wondering, if these turbines get built off Block Island as you expect them to, can people see them? Can people go out and, and what's going to be sort of, it could almost be a tourist attraction. Uh, I think many people will want to go out and see them, frankly. They will be quite the sight. It'll be, uh, you know, it'll be a first for North America, really, to see these uh, wind turbines off the coast. So they'll be about three miles southeast of Block Island. So you'll be able to go to that southeast corner of the island and see them at, at a distance. But my guess is quite a few people will be taking their boats out there. So let's turn to some broader questions. I mentioned 38 Studios earlier. You, you worked for Governor Kachiri. I don't think you were there when, when 38 no, Studios wasn't. transpired, yeah. as you're probably yeah. glad to, many, to say. I left many years before you're that. A while before yes. that, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I mean, what, what, do you, what do you take away from, from what we've just seen as someone who served in government and knew that, you know, Governor Kachiri said to us at the time, it was hard to be the governor of Rhode Island when we had all sorts of other problems with our business climate. You went looking for things like, they said, you know, deep water was an example where we could sort of attract them, 38 Studios was. I mean, what's your take now that as we're looking back on what happened? Yeah, well, I think it's, you know, I, I hope that one consequence is that people don't draw the conclusion that there's no role at all for state governments to get involved in economic development because they because state governments do play a role. And I think in addition to setting the stage and, and, and doing all the fundamentals like keeping taxes low, having regulatory processes that are transparent and quick, um, and having good schools, um, governments play roles. There are, you know, we have a credit crunch in the country today. Uh, and there are a lot of good companies out there that probably could use some additional assistance. And that's the perfect role for a state government uh, to take a look at its strengths, to try to foster uh, a cluster of industries, uh, and to help with credit support. So I think, you know, while uh, while we look back and 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 it's awful what happened with 38 Studios, I don't think that in the long term we ought to sort of abandon the idea of looking at what are the real needs out there in the business community and try to fill those gaps. And I think right now, you know, credit crunch for small businesses is is kind of a big one. What about uh, the EDC? You served in, I know there were, um, there were various debates during the Kachiri years about what to do about the EDC now. Governor Chafee is looking at, this is the uh, Economic Development Corporation. Uh, first of all, have you, has the EDC played any role in, in what you've done with, with Deepwater? I think early on EDC played a role in, uh, in the selection of, uh, of an offshore wind developer. They were part of the team that made the selection. And of course, EDC also is the entity that uh, controls Quonset Point through a subsidiary. So the Quonset Development Corporation is a subsidiary of the Economic Development Corp. Uh, Deepwater has a, has a lease at Quonset Point. Uh, we have 65 acres under lease at Quonset, and we pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to the state of Rhode Island f for that lease. Uh, and that's where we'll be uh, basing a lot of our construction and, and fabrication operations for the wind farms. So with so EDC... We do, we do deal with them because of that. Well, do you think, is there a... It, especially what, having seen it in government and now having been outside in the business world, yeah. is there a need for EDC? Do you think should we maybe abolish it, move to a Secretary of Commerce model? I mean, what, what's your view? Is it, is it, a, is it relevant? I, I think it will always be important for business to know where to go to in state government. You know, we want to move to the state. How do we do it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, are there loan programs we can qualify for? How do we uh, find the right kind of worker training? Uh, how do we qualify for different programs? I think having a one-stop shop is important. I think in the long term, you know, probably my bias is that 
every arm of state government needs to be accountable directly to an elected official. So I tend to look at economic development and think long term. And you, you were chief of staff? I was chief of staff of the governor. Was it so hard that's, my, sort of so that's to, probably um, my bias as someone who <laughs> yeah, works for the governor. <laughs> I, think it, I think it's important for agencies to report directly to a governor or another elected And what official. was the relationship with EDC? Or, uh, was it sort of doing its own thing but you were involved because he was on the board? Or was, it, well, was there it, a disconnect? How did you see well, it? Well, I think uh, the way economic development has been driven in the state to date, it's been a separate corporation. The governor acts as chair of that corporation. So it's one step removed from your other average state agency like the Department of Health, the Department of Transportation, where the governor hires and fires the head of those those agencies. Um, the same is not true for economic development. Mm -hmm. um, another question along the political lines. You know, you worked in a Republican administration. Republicans are not often super enthused about alternative energy right. these days. Uh, there's a lot of talk about it being, you know, overpriced. It's sort of to make liberals feel good. You know, there's all the talk about Solyndra and that company that fell apart under President Obama. If yeah. you're talking to Republicans, wh what's your argument to them about, you know, why this is something they should be in favor of, you know, building up alternative energy? Yeah, you know, there are some Republicans, but I will admit that, uh, that the overwhelming majority of support for renewable energy today uh, comes from the Democratic side of the aisle, unfortunately. But I think, Do the you think that's a mistake on their part. Do you think the Republicans? I, I, I think it is a mistake. I, I think I think the best I guess argument. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> I think the best argument um, for those on the Republican side of the aisle is that as a country, we we can't be wedded to one or two sources of fuel, and our international competitors, China and Germany, are number one and number two in investments in clean energy technology, and while those investments. Uh, are for power sources that right now might look more expensive than the cheapest sources of fuel. In 10 or 20 years, we may be looking back with a great amount of regret uh, at allowing those, our in international competitors to make these huge investments without matching them. What's the outlook right now for um, when you mentioned earlier natural gas? And I mean, when you're looking at the energy mix and the how it's changed a lot, the price of natural gas since you guys came Absolutely. on the scene around in 2008. Yeah. I mean, how does that affect your project and your planning? Well, you know, I think uh, it, it, it's slightly more challenging in the near term, but it doesn't really change the big picture because if you look at what's happened with natural gas, it really confirms the story. It's, a, it's subject to a lot of market factors. We've seen gas prices really high just a few years ago. Now we see gas prices really low. Um, and it's very likely that those gas prices are going to come up again. It's, it's market driven. It's a global market for gas. And those prices are volatile, and you, can't, you simply can't lock in those prices long term. Therefore, it's important to have at least part of your energy mix locked in and stable. It's like any other sort of investment you make. Certain investments might fluctuate a bit more, but part of your portfolio, maybe you put in bonds and you lock in a, a, a different kind of rate that you can depend on longer term. And if Rhode Island gave up on offshore wind, do you think other states would be galloping forward with it? Well, you get the sense? a lot other states are. So Mass our neighbor in Massachusetts has been at the forefront of offshore wind for a number of years. New Jersey and Delaware and uh, Maryland and New York, they're all deeply involved in offshore wind. That's all the time we have this week. I want to thank our guest, Jeff Grabowski, first guest. Thank and you, I want to thank you for watching the debut of Executive Suite here on MyRI TV. If you missed any of the show, you can catch it on our website, WPRI.com. I'm Ted Nisi. We'll see you next week and every week here on Executive Suite.